got to pay attention to your states because the distractions we have in D.C. are taking you away from the WEF infiltration of your states. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and this is the Miles Franklin Weekly Special for September 18th through September 25th, 2023, while supplies last. This week we feature two different specials, 10 bar bundles of Nordic Mint 5 ounce bars at $1.99 over spot per ounce, and quarter ounce gold eagles at $59.99 over melt. First, when you purchase 10 or more 5 ounce Nordic Mint bars, you pay only $1.99 over spot per ounce. Three nines fine silver, these are priced lower than almost anything else other than 1,000 ounce bars, but with the far better liquidity of the 5 ounce size. The Gold Eagle was first released in 1986 and has been one of the most popular gold bullion coins in the world, providing incredible recognizability and investor trust. The quarter ounce Eagle is additionally sought after for its high degree of flexibility and liquidity. Like the one ounce Eagle, the quarter Eagle is 22 karat gold strengthened with copper. It's one quarter of a troy ounce of gold, comes 40 to a tube, 2,000 to a box, and it's available at just $59.99 over melt while supplies last. Both our specials this week are IRA eligible. If you'd like to learn more about a precious metals IRA, call us, and we'll be happy to help you in that process. To order our specials or any of the many other options we have available, call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We're delighted to have this returning guest. Patrick Holland is the founder of the Missouri Freedom Initiative. He joins us this Thursday, September 21st, 2023. Patrick, thanks for coming back on Liberty and Finance. Done again. Thank you so much for having me back. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. I got referred to you by a viewer who insisted that we had to have you on to talk about progress that's being made in grassroots efforts to restore the role that sound money should and always did play in our lives and is uh, in ensconced in our constitution, in the coinage act of 1792, et cetera, but has fallen out of popular use due to some pretty unconstitutional things that happened starting in 1913 with the formation of the Federal Reserve and imposition of federal income tax and debasement of our currency ever since 1964, 1971. Pick a date. Uh, we've been on a slippery slope to take away the power of the ordinary individual. One of the things we, you and I were just discussing is in our many interviews with Wayne Jett, the founder of Fruits of Graft, the Great Depressions then and now, he talked about uh, how it is natural law and natural rights for a worker who has given up part of his life voluntarily to do you know, work, to do servitude, uh, to take the fruits of that labor. And I, you can look at it as the most basic thing is if you're a hunter gatherer, you intrinsically get the fruits of your labor. You, you, you hunt something or you gather something, it's yours and, and you got it. But in the case of wanting to save it for the future, that's also your business. And if you are employed by someone who's going to pay you, you have the right to hold that pay as the fruits of your labor and keep it in your own pocket for some future need or necessity and use it privately uh, in your own time and for your own purposes. That's natural law, natural right. And he says the biggest trick that the bankers ever played on us was to say, no, the working man does not get to put the fruits of his labor in his own pocket. He has to write it on a slip of paper and put it in the banker's pocket. And there the banker can play any number of tricks of debasing the currency, of uh, speculating elsewhere with that uh, fruit of the uh, of the workers uh, labor so that it's not even there and for ready for him to to retrieve it or devalue it tax it etc all kinds of things that we are becoming so numb to because we've become accustomed to them for the past several generations that now when I have clients who are uh, trying to relearn what their great-grandparents and everybody who knew before them knew like that gold and silver are true money and you have a right to hold on to it and it preserves value through time, etc. They feel like some of them that they're going out on a limb and trying something that's rather experimental and rather something that's rather risky or frightening or something to to hold precious metals as a way of storing wealth. So that's the first thing I wanted to get from you is, is your philosophy and that of the Missouri Freedom Initiative as you approach this, this uh, natural right as Wayne Jett calls it, of the worker to hold on to the fruits of his labor in the form of sound money. What is it about sound money that you think is so important to protect ordinary people uh, against overreach of government or against loss of their financial freedom? Two words, loyal title. Have you heard that before? I have. 
Go ahead. That is a very, very important concept and a phrase that most of us don't even know anymore. Uh, in fact, I don't even know how to spell it properly. Uh, so, in fact, even as I read, I never find that in there. You know, loyal title means something that you own free and clear. There is no third-party risk at all. Land was supposed to be loyal title in this in this country, and so was money, gold and silver. You owned it. Uh, no one could stake a claim on it, but that is certainly not true with the monetary supply. We're going to get back to gold and silver in a second here. Let me talk about the moral hazards we deal with in today's society now. Then again, you and I probably own homes, and uh, we think we own them. We use the word own. We don't know the word loyal, but we do know the word own, and we misuse the word own. We are leaseholders of the land because the government technically owns the land, and they will tax you every year on that land. If you don't pay the tax on that land, they will physically remove you from your property and give it to someone who will pay the taxes on your land. So loyal title's gone for land. And this is uh, an absolute travesty, and it's also morally wrong. Back to gold and silver. With gold and silver, that should be loyal title too, but it isn't in certain states. Um, you either have income tax on gold and silver, you know, also known as, uh, what do they refer to that as, capital gains. And then also, some states have even more moral hazard by having sales tax on gold and silver. So, you know, so basically it's like sales tax on food. It is something that you need to survive and money is one of those things. It's right up there with oxygen. We shouldn't worship it. It's a tool like anything else, but you shouldn't have to give up a lump of flesh to be able to have your rights in order for, for me to buy food, you know, so I can stay alive in the state of Missouri. I have to give an ounce of flesh to the government in the form of sales tax for food. So this is wrong. This is morally wrong and, uh, well, in every other way, it's wrong too, actually. Uh, we, we're trying to get rid of that in Missouri, but we're, there's resistance. So now go back to silver and gold. Loyal title. You should own that free and clear, and you should be able to trade with that free and clear. And the fruits of your labor, more specifically, your energy, your time, and your talent, you know, basically belong to you. Now, if you're religious, 10% of that goes to God. And I believe in that, by the way. Um, but that's it. You know, the government shouldn't be able to stake a claim. If you believe that God's the creator of everything, you know, basically, then, you know, you have one worldview. If you believe the government is God, then you have another worldview. And under those two worldviews, you'll find very big differences on what should be taxed. And so that's the moral hazard we run into. And uh, I think you touched on this quite strongly there beyond tax taxation, which can then be used as a, as a lever to, to wrest something out of your grasp. There's that whole concept underlying that of personal property rights or private property ownership. And there's been great concern. Uh, 20th century writer G.K. Chesterton, the, who wrote the first third of the 20th century, uh, most people haven't heard of him, but should, should look him up, uh, wrote that that's one of the things that absolutely, uh, if a government has a role, it's to protect people's private property rights. <laughs> it seems that government has assumed its role is almost exactly the opposite of that. Yeah, that's right. Because it seems like their main responsibility is to figure out how to make you feel good about taking away the fruits of your labor and feel comfortable with it and, and see that it's, quote unquote, a necessity to steal the fruits of your labor and in ever increasing quantities year after year after year. And uh, we're not even talking about inflation. That's what I was going to say, Ta the hidden tax, the, the, the cowardly tax of inflation. Maybe you want to hit on that because most people uh, really haven't thought about it in that way that the Fed having for years and years and years stated as a policy goal, a 2% per year inflation target. And now they're saying, well, it might have to be more like 3%. And then according to John Williams of shadowstats.com, they're, they're skating between 8 to 14% per year, basically stealing your wages, your savings, your retirement. Uh, how does the Missouri Freedom Initiative uh, look at that phenomenon? Well, we, we look at that as immoral first off. Uh, and also too, we'll get into, you know, we could talk a little bit about the manipulation of the price of gold and silver. Everything has gone up a lot in the last three years done again. And everything except for gold and silver. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? 
they're the only the only commodities on the planet that just don't seem to go up with inflation. And that's and and once again, you know, we could talk about you know the market premiums, you know, actually kind of adjusting for that a little bit. A lot of people have a problem with that and say, no, that's just sheer greed of the dealers. That is not true. This is a free market mechanism, and I'll say that over and over again. And I'm not a dealer. That is a free market mechanism to adjust for supply and demand. But our, our organization's position is uh, gold and silver in any form, whether it be electronic through a bullion bank, whether it be gold backs, which I personally really like, and then also gold and silver coins or bars are money. And they should be used as money because that is loyal title. So, but unfortunately that starts interrupting, you know, basically the plans of people, you know, in power about, you know, how taxation works. And, in, you know, we even, when we were going through this in the state of Missouri in hearings, uh, people are saying, well, that's how people hide, you know, from taxes. You know, they use gold and silver. Well, gosh, darn it. No, they use cash, cash. Uh, people don't store gold and silver to get away from the tax man, despite the fact that, you know, everyone's going, well, that's what John Wick does. Well, that's a movie, gang. That's a movie. Um, if you want to see a really great movie, you know, with gold in it, it's Kelly's Heroes, you know, where they go into, uh, you know, the German territory and, and take it, take a bank that's full of gold. But the once again, will divert back to moral hazard in what the government has done, taking away the ability of us to actually keep you know, the fruits of our labor. In other words, saying, if you want to be a part of society, you're going to have to pay. You're going to have to pay. And we're going to ever increase the amount you have to pay until you have nothing left because inflation. Remember we talked about the 4% last time? Do the math on 4% inflation over a person's 80-year lifetime. It's 23 times. 23 times. I mean, that's insane. Um, think about that for a second. Do you expect your income to go up 23 times during that same period? It ain't going to happen. That is not going to happen. Who benefits the most when inflation rears its ugly head? Well, businesses can, for sure, but so do banks and governments. They're the beneficiaries. And if we go into deflation, Duggan, Dunnigan, <laughs> uh, banks and, and governments do not do well under that scenario. And guess what gold and silver is? It's a deflationary currency. Uh, I'm sorry, it's deflationary money. Uh, so let me get my term straight here. That is not true with the Federal Reserve note. That is inflationary. In fact, I'd like to call it hyperinflationary at this point. I mean, this is getting insane what we've been going through in the last three years. That's one of the concerns that people are starting to have. And I think you're right that most people are aware that they're paying more and more and more uh, but actually, this is the ironic thing. No, in nominal terms, people are seeing prices rise, but they're, and this is something that Alistair McLeod, former bank director, keeps reminding us and people say, oh, it's just playing with words, but it's not. That it's not prices going higher, it's the currency devaluing. The, the things that we're buying, whether it's gasoline or whether it's cars or whether it's houses or whatever, are just things. They're not changing uh, substantially, but the, the currency with which we're forced to deal with is getting smaller and smaller. And if, you, if, you're, if your yardstick is shrinking, everything's going to look like it's measuring bigger. That gets another, another criminal uh, theft is uh, what you call the capital gains tax. And that's true. Anytime you go to sell anything and the government says, well, it's nominally now priced higher than it was when you bought it. Therefore, you in, you enjoyed a gain, and you didn't really because you turn around your purchasing power in that with those proceeds is about the same. No matter what you're going to turn around and try to buy, it's just that they, by debasing the currency, have created artificial, false apparent gains that they can then claim are something they can tax. So everywhere you turn around, there's another opportunity for the government to skim off um, some of the your life and your freedom and your privacy by making you participate in the system. Uh, Missouri Freedom Initiative has taken a different approach, working vigorously to reestablish the rights of people to uh, hold on to real money. And uh, if you can talk to us about what you see as the key goals, like if we could do these three things or these four things, this would be very meaningful and impactful to people's lives and their freedom and their privacy going forward. Thank you for that. Uh, we're very close to getting our legislation done. Uh, literally, it's it's just around the corner, and we're very very careful with the words we use. I mean, I've I've been in touch with Senator Eigel's office. So, the 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 main goal is number one: acknowledge gold and silver as legal tender. 
Now, I have some purists that tell me that's insane. Gold and silver are already money. Why inject it into, you know, uh, legislation and put it in your, you know, your uniform code in the state of Missouri as legal tender? Well, that's because that's what businesses want. If businesses want it, are, are going to use gold and silver, they need to know that, first of all, the state sees it as money as actually transactable money. Because right now there's nothing in our elite, well, that we have one little thing in our about uh, silver uh, dimes, actually. It's, strangely enough, we have that in our uniform code. Uh, but that's it. Uh, we need broad spectrum, silver and gold as money as legal tender. That's number one. Number two is, which a state should do if they're going for this, is number two, make sure that the state accepts gold and silver for payment of taxes. Now, Dunnigan, that doesn't mean that you're going to, you know, walk down to your state government and say, oh, here's, here's, uh, you know, uh, two ounces of gold and, and 15 ounces of silver. Here's my taxes. You're not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. But the very fact that it's on paper that we actually can do that gives a lot of weight to the fact that gold and silver is legal tender in your state. So that's number two. And if I could, you know, go beyond that, those are critical things. By the way, if you have sales tax in your state, you must get rid of that first. It has to go first and then you can make the other, you know. Sales tax specifically on precious metals? Correct. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you for clarifying. Sales tax on precious metals has to go. I think there's eight states left in the union that have that. And every state that has that needs to get rid of that. That is, first of all, it's immoral. So we could go on moral grounds, but also it's insanely stupid because gold and silver are actually money. Since when are you taxed on the exchange from dollar to gold and silver? Well, in these states, uh, Minnesota is one of them. I come from Minnesota. And so that's one that has it. Okay. So you have to get rid of that. We already talked about legal tender and we've talked about taking in taxes. Let's talk about the big one now, the big enchilada. And that's getting a depository in your state. So. Okay. And, and once again, a lot of people will, you know, say, oh, that's messing with the Federal Reserve. Well, maybe, you know, I, I, I honestly, I'm not looking out for the interests of the Federal Reserve. I'm looking out for the interests of the people of Missouri. And if we're going to go through inflation, we have to have a mechanism to actually at least try to keep up with inflation. We have to in our state because we have pension funds in our state. And so look at that. I'm not a state employee in here. I'm looking out for the state employees. Um, you have to have a way to keep up with inflation. Plus also, if something really bad happens to the dollar, you need a transactable currency beyond the dollar that people can go to that the state recognizes and already has some of, and that would be a depository. And then on top of which, um, and I won't say this is number four, but also in your legislation, you should have, um, you know, a clause in there that states can transact between other states with gold and silver, physical gold and silver. So the only other thing I would say, is, you said four musts, and is give a value to gold and silver in your bill. Now, in our bill, we did something spectacular that no one had ever seen before. We actually gave a value to gold and silver. And that was uh, actually we start with uh, weight and then purity spot price, and then, of course, the market premium. Those four things aggregate the price of gold and silver. And so we didn't give an actual price. We're setting a price of $38 for silver. We're not doing that. The free market must, must drive this. We don't want government telling us how to use gold and silver or how much it's worth. We, we don't want that nonsense in our state. And it looks like the other states don't want that nonsense either. So those would be the four main components that you need to really, truly start taking your economic freedom back in your state using gold and silver legislation to do so. It's interesting. We've uh, interviewed Australian economist John Adams several times from Ad Adams Economics, and he and his partner, Martin North, uh, partner of uh, their common website, which is called In the Interest of the People, uh, took up legis uh, basically battled legislation that was coming through the Australian Parliament, which was the $10,000 cash transaction ban. And the government was trying to make it that any transaction of $10,000 or more in cash in Australia would be illegal. And their claim was it was only used for criminal enterprise. That's why they had to do this and tax cheats and that kind of thing. Well, of course, you guys used to see the movies. And they defended, they defended uh, the rights of ordinary businesses, ordinary individuals, and something to use 
to use cash to settle even even though you know we have legal tender uh pr whatever provisions printed on our our silly federal reserve notes that we use but governments have been working to try to invalidate the use of cash first they eliminated the the ten thousand dollar bill and the thousand dollar bill and the five hundred dollar bill we're down to the hundred dollars and smaller and as inflation drives those to be uh, less and less meaningful denominations uh, that makes it more cumbersome for people to use it for carrying around and using it for larger transactions. But um, this is an example. This is the forerunning example of what's being done also with with precious metals. And so restoring the ability of people to use them or, or use systems that would account for actual ownership of precious metals in ordinary transactions as well. Can, does your proposed legislation, and maybe that's the first part, the legal tender status, does it does it uh, make any provision for the people of Missouri, for example, if you're selling a ranch or selling a home or, or selling a business or whatever, to uh, have the contract, the, the purchase agreement, actually written out in terms of the equivalent value of of metal uh, money, true money, rather than just stating it in dollar terms, anything like that. Yeah, you could do that. I think you could probably do that in any state. But uh, escaping, you know, uh, Uncle Sam with that is still impossible. You know, uh, in fact, I could talk about this, you know, ad nauseum, and I won't, but it's a very fascinating topic. And that is basically private property versus real estate. And private property just doesn't exist anymore. I mean, there are certain pockets of private property all around the United States. But uh, this would be, you know, basically something that was taken away in, in, in Missouri, I read in 1978, um, where you could convert your property from real estate into private property by buying the bond from the county. That silly out of nothing thing that they created saying that they owned that land, the county. You could actually buy it from them and hold the bond and then own your property, truly own, and that got you out of property taxes. Now that's gone in the state of Missouri. Some states don't have property tax and hey, good on you. Uh, but we unfortunately are not in that boat. So that's you know a part of it, but I think that the uh, you know basically buying and selling of land with gold and silver is going to become very popular here inside the next few years or maybe the next decade. Another issue that you've spoken on other platforms about just recently, it's a breaking story, is about the World Economic Forum, WEF, uh, collaborating with a software company that creates a constituency management software for the use of uh, different government organizations at different levels regarding uh, related to the operation of government and sometimes uh, elections. And that's deeply concerning to many because as we've been talking about the loss of intrinsic uh, natural rights of ordinary people, it's always the loss of subsidiarity. In other words, the power moving from the local person up to the state or to the federal or even to the supranational global uh, enterprise and un, uh, unrepresentative influences from those organizations, those global influences. People have talked about the UN uh, treaties and that sort of thing where we could have local governments raise, you know, throwing up their hands and going, well, there's nothing we can do about it. It's, it's, we're just following uh, whether it's uh, health regulations or whether it's economic regulations, or whether it's environmental regulations or whether it's military regulations. We're just, we're just doing what the globalist uh, group tells us we have to do. This is uh, against the, the general moral law of uh, subsidiarity saying that the decisions should be made at the lowest and most local level that would both respect to the, the local conditions, the local community, the local individuals and families involved. So can you talk to us about why uh, the Missouri Freedom Initiative is so concerned about this WEF-related uh, constituent management software? Okay, uh, first off, uh, I'm going to address something you said just a little bit ago, you know, following orders. It kind of reminds me of the Nuremberg trials. I was just following orders. I was just following orders. That's, that's what my commanding officer told me what to do. Yet that, you know, and, you know ended up taking people's lives and, and, you know, hey, I was just following orders. Well, the WEF, uh, and and let's and yes, we definitely got involved in a, a little scuffle. Not scuffle is not a good. We we broke a story, and it was it was wonderful because we were successful. Um, but yes, I want to inform people, and I did do this on another platform, that the there is a company called Fiscal Note. Fiscal Note is the name of the company, and then uh, the name of the software that they actually put out is called Fireside. Fiscal Note is partnered with the WEF. 
So you can actually look that up very easily by going to weforum.org and then look at the partner list and you'll find fiscal note. So the constituency management software that they're peddling around the country right now um, basically is constituency management, you know, but with, with a twist. It's got AI capability. Uh, they take your database for your state, you know, constituents, and they take it off site. Uh, they get access to the voter rolls and all information on all constituents. So there's one more twist to it. They're ESG compliant. So what does it mean to be e or ESG compliant when it comes to software? And basically, from my research, it just basically plays into what we call social credit scoring. So that's what ESG compliance software means. It means it can work easily with social credit scoring or it's it's ready to work in that or it can be plugged into. But one more thing I found out was that lobbyists could get access to the database. So, and that's another strange thing. I mean, that just doesn't happen in states right now. Uh, it shouldn't happen. So what we did in Missouri is, is there's another group that I work with called Rogue Politics. And they actually were, they just fell upon the story. And so they were doing research on it for, you know, roughly about a month. And uh, we had to break the story uh, about 36 hours before we had a house hearing in the state of Missouri. And what we did is we vetted the software and we vetted the software company. Now, why is Pat Holland doing that? I'm not a politician. I'm not an elected official. Why am I doing that? It's because it was snuck up on them during a governor's veto session. There was no agenda for the governor's veto session other than to deal with vetoes. And somehow the Speaker of the House, his name is Dean Plocker, right here in the state of Missouri. And once again, we're talking about Missouri politics. Uh, somehow was able to sneak this into a House hearing to actually get a vote on whether or not to get the software without legislation, without appropriations, and without anyone knowing anything about it. In fact, uh, Representative Scott Cups uh, stood up and said, we don't do things this way. We have committee hearings. You know, we, we you know, vet the, comp the company, we vet the product before we make a long-term large purchase of $800,000 in, in for a two-year contract. Oh, but wait, there's more. Dean Plocker, we heard, was going to get $800,000 matching funds put into his political pack. So it, it, this is where the rubber hits the road here. So then what is the software worth if they're giving it away for free? It's because the software wasn't worth anything. What's worth money is the data. The database, the constituency database is what they want. And every state is going to deal with this. And we're breaking a nationwide story, literally started about 10 days ago, because no one knows this is coming. And we found uh, lobbyists for uh, fiscal note, you know, literally in four states already. And by the way, they have left Missouri. Apparently, they don't feel welcome here. So the lobbyists have been deregistered in the state of Missouri on September 15th. Um, so <laughs> that's a good thing, by the way, when something like that happens. But once again, it's because uh, people like, you know, the Missouri Freedom Initiative, Rogue Politics, will actually take the time to actually look into stuff that they're trying to sneak in under the radar. And then we'll make sure that everyone in, in the uh, Missouri legislature knows about what we found. And they were very uncomfortable even discussing the software at that point once we told them what we found out in the form of a video that was available on YouTube. So, yes, we're actively trying to keep the WF out of our state because they're trying to whittle their way in. And this is my message to everyone out there. And it's a danger Will Robinson message. Well, we're all focusing on all the theatrics and the circus going on in D.C. Things are going on in your state. And you probably don't even know. So as your attention is diverted, look at what we did. I mean, our legislators didn't even know about this software. They didn't, you know, they came in for a veto session off of a, you know, a six, seven month break for a veto session. And they were blindsided by hearing with software pressure from the uh, House Speaker, Dean Plocker, to purchase it. And of course, with the promise of distributing funds to everybody who votes yes, you know, out of that $800,000 PAC donation. So this is going on in your state, too. Is Missouri a horrible place to live? You keep, you know, Pat, you know, you keep exposing all this bad news about Missouri. Well, that's right. You can't clean up unless you actually make things public. 
And uh, we keep finding out about uh, this uh, phenomenon that happens. One's, one people have uh, called it never let a good crisis go to waste. Others have said that we have to vote, pass the bill so we can find out what's in it. And uh, others have said, wait a minute, how can it be that when we do have a crisis or some issue that comes up within a few days to a, to a week or so, we've got a so many thousand page bill ready to vote on, ready to pass. Clearly, the solutions have been created in advance by a very strategic, very shrewd, very, very uh, methodically planning uh, parties and uh, at a very high level, not at the local level, so that then they can be foisted upon uh, individual, whether it's at the state level, whether it's at the national level, and then the, the ordinary voter who's got their representative in there goes, what are you doing? Where, where, are the, where are the actual representation of the people in this process? And how are you looking out for the best interests of the freedom, the privacy um, of the ordinary individual, the ordinary family? Uh, gravely concerning if WEF linked company and software are being foisted off as um, good for states and without the knowledge of the people of the state. So what specifically is this software? We, we've heard that the concern is that it would have access to all of your uh, electronic data for all the people. And uh, that's not good for privacy. It's not good for um, a, a lot of the uh, representation expectations that people have in a, in a, in a, in a republic. But uh, what is it about th that the government claims is what they're trying to accomplish with this software? The, there's often a big divergence between the actual benefit of your data in the hands of government versus what they claim, why they claim they need this. That is a really, really good question, but I don't think you're going to like my answer. There was no benefit. We found out through this process that the existing constituency management software we have is written in-house by our very own IT staff and the database is housed right there in the Capitol, physically and digitally secured. And it works great. People came to testify at the hearing how great the software is. Why are we even looking at replacing it? But the, you know, and once again, I'm going to connect a couple of dots for you here because the last time we talked, I may have mentioned the name Dean Plocker. Those of you who uh, watched last time, Dean Plocker is the guy who shut down our silver and gold bill. He's also the guy trying to get WEF software into the state. So, I mean, I think that's important that we identify people in our states that are elected officials that are actually doing the bidding of corporations. They're corporatists, mercantilists, you know, crony capitalists, you know, fascists, you know, pick your word. But you, your state has these people and you you absolutely have to keep an eye on them. Am, am I, you know, basically, uh, you know, uh, a hater of Dean Plocker? No. But at the same time, I'm going to point out anything I find that he's doing that is, let's just say, has the appearance of impropriety. He shut down the silver and gold bill, and now he's trying to install WDF software in the state. And by the way, that failed. The the just a you know a spoiler. In the committee hearing, they unanimously said no, and then there was a vote, another unanimous vote, saying we're not going to revisit this for two years. Don't bring this back for two years. So that was a major win. Your organization, the Missouri Freedom Initiative, is grassroots in nature. Uh, it's not in, not incorporated as a corporation in Missouri. And there's been a significant concern, and I respect it, on the parts of many who would like to stand up for the freedom of ordinary people, saying that, gee, we had the Tea Party, we had other organizations, uh, initiatives that happened or related to whether it was January 6th or whatever, where people uh, with good intention, trying to stand up for ordinary people, constitutional rights, that sort of thing, uh, felt like they got infiltrated, they got influenced uh, by other parties that were not on the behalf of the ordinary people, not standing up for ordinary people's rights. But you've taken a different approach, and it reminds me of one that G. Edward Griffin, who was one of the first people we interviewed on our channel back in 2013, the author of The Creature from Jekyll Island, another look at the Federal Reserve, talked about his organization, Freedom Force International, and he said, he said to me, uh, Dunnigan, you should, you should join us because uh, we want people who are able to think clearly, able to speak clearly, able to organize and influence uh, individuals and that sort of thing. Because he said a lot of the downfall of grassroots organizations is that they become infiltrated or they, they become uh, so 
uh, similar in pyramidal uh, pyramidal structure to the or, to the power structures of the government that they're trying to resist on the part of ordinary people. That all it takes is getting getting the uh, government to come down hard on the leader or the head or whatever, and it can undermine the efficacy of the entire organization. He said our organization is not leaderless; it's leaderful. He said, it's like a fractal. Everywhere you look, you find people that are educated and they're articulate and they're motivated and they know why they're there and they're there to try to help the ordinary person. So you can't just take out one or two or 10 people and uh, disable our movement because it's based on the people itself. Uh, what's the way that the Missouri Freedom Initiative is progressing to try to sustain that mission of standing up for ordinary people and to be less vulnerable to this sort of this Gita decapitation method that often happens against organizations that try to stand up for ordinary people? That's a, a very, very good question, too. In fact, it's, I, I, find it, I found it really difficult to articulate it until you said what, uh, what Griffin had told you. And first of all, we operate under a name, the Missouri Freedom Initiative. The name is not registered with the state. There is no corporation. There is no filing. We don't take donations. Everyone pays their own way. So we, we call it your own time, your own dime. And so under that structure, I'm kind of an organizer, really. But everyone, everyone is a leader in our organization by far. I mean, they're all contacting their representatives, their senators. Uh, many of them come up to, to Jefferson City for what we call knock and shock. Um, and they participate in the events that we do. And so... You know, I may, some people may mistakenly think I'm a leader because, you know, I'm the front man or I'm the guy who's doing videos all the time, but nothing could be further from the truth. I, you know, I, I'm just an organizer of a bunch of people. I do organize them, but my God, I mean, I set them loose, you know, and they can roam down the halls of Jefferson city and they know, I'm sorry, our capital, Jefferson city, Missouri, um, and in the halls of the Capitol, and they know exactly what to do. They don't need me leading them, holding their hands. Uh, so but that's the structure we have as well. And so there's a danger in when you have an organization and before long you 501c3 it or 508 it or however you're going to do it. And uh, then you're taking donations. But in the state of Missouri, they're looking for excuses to call a group a lobbyist group. And then that has a whole new set of rules. We have so much freedom by not being a lobbyist, by not being a corporation, by not taking donations. So that's the really cool thing about it. Um, you know, so anything that costs something in the organization, uh, generally I pay for, and that's just out of, you know, I have a job, you know, so I'll go, you know, the website, you know, things of that nature, you know, getting business cards done, uh, running around the state and speaking publicly. And I do a lot of that actually. And I'm currently on a tour of Republican central committee meetings. And actually that in itself is its own story right now. Uh, because we're we're actually letting the Republican Party know we're really done with the squishy Republicans. Some people call them rhinos. I prefer call them squishy Republicans. We're really, really done with you in the state of Missouri, and we're getting rid of you. We're we're we just don't have any patience anymore, and we're tired of you. So uh, basically, there is a grassroots effort to make that happen in the state of Missouri for the 2024 elections, outing everyone who's squishy, like Dean Plocker. Hey, Dean. Sorry, buddy, but you are squishy. I'm terribly sorry. Um, and uh, Patterson, you know, John Patterson, the floor leader. There's all kinds of squishy stuff going on here. But that's the power of the grassroots. They can't come after us, you know, basically saying, well, you're a lobbyist or, you know, this or that or the other thing. They really just can't. And we don't even know the size of our group, Dunnigan. That's how wonderful this is. We're kind of anonymous that way. Yeah, we have an email list that's like 1,700 people. We have a Twitter account that's got 19,000 people, a YouTube account that's got 1,000 1, people, uh, an Odyssey channel that's got 200 people. You know, pick your number. Uh, so that's all we know. You know? <laughs> so basically, there's no sign up. There's no membership dues. You know, there's no official, you know, I pledge that I will follow these rules. You know, I'm in the Missouri Freedom Initiative. There's no, um, you know, hey, when you call your representative or senator, make sure to mention Missouri Freedom Initiative. We don't even do that. Um, it's just a name that we use to organize, dare I say it, the really, really pissed off conservatives in Missouri. <laughs> For people who want to make these kind of changes in their state and to educate their 
uh, lawmakers and to get uh, people organized in a sense of participation, get them active as you have in Missouri. I understand you've got some resources that some models you've you've gone a lot of the heavy lifting and provided some templates and so on some packages that people can can leverage where can they find those well actually uh we have two channels because we actually came together under truth money and freedom podcast on youtube so that's where we were doing our sapa battle the second amendment preservation act and uh that channel uh, is mirrored on odyssey thank god because uh we keep getting strikes on that on that channel even though it's dormant uh, so currently we're writing it two strikes on that channel because the rules changed on YouTube and they went back to four year old content and said that it was in violation of the community guidelines or something like that. So at any rate, they're trying to get rid of it. And, but we do have it backed up on Odyssey and there you could see how it was done. Um, literally you could see how, because we did it with two, uh, it, with YouTube and Facebook. And then what happened was there was someone on YouTube that uh, gave us a shout out because they were really interested in what we were doing with the Second Amendment Preservation Act. This was a monster big channel. And that helped us a great deal to bring more Missourians attention to our channel. And that's just kind of how it started. However, it's gotten significantly bigger since then in a variety of different ways. And actually we intend to do a, uh, a couple of short videos and some write-ups on how we did it so we can show other states how we did what we did. It's important that you have something like this in your state too. It doesn't have to be exactly like the Missouri Freedom Initiative. You got to pay attention to your states because the distractions we have in DC are taking you away from the WEF infiltration of your states. I forgot to amplify this when you brought it up earlier, and that was the importance of a state depository. We've had a lot of our clients who are looking to acquire bullion, most want to have it held in their direct uh, personal possession, which is, as you talked about, private property, that's the best way to make it private. Yep. And But however, after they've been at it a while, some, and depending on whether they're going to be moving or whether they live in an apartment or that sort of situation, depending on their life situation, some want to have a significant portion of their holdings held, not right where they live so that they don't have to be the only one guarding their their treasure but they have someone else guarding their treasure so they can go on vacation or whatever um so they the idea of a depository for individuals as well as uh, participation by states is important uh there's been lots of questions asked by these people on which states or which jurisdictions are leading the way in terms of uh, standing up for the privacy and personal property rights of ordinary individuals in the form of depositories. Uh, many have mentioned the Texas depository in that same breath. Uh, you said it's very important for states to establish a depository. What, what do you see as the key indicators that a state is doing the right things uh, in establishing their depository? And where do you see that happening? Okay, and that's a very interesting question because it prongs off into another area. Is the state going to create a state sovereign bank? you know, with that depository, once they have enough gold and silver in there, can they actually get away with that? Texas is looking into doing things like that with theirs as well. Um, but right now, I mean, I think the model, the best model, you know, that we have and once again, there's many models, but I'm going to say bullion banks, there's gold money, UPMA, they have excellent models for that. And then hopefully they have a branch near where you live. Um, this is my personal opinion, uh, because I don't store gold and silver in, you know, in vaults. So I'm not in that, in that category, but I will tell you that if I had to store in a vault, I would literally be looking for one that's in reasonable driving distance from my house. Number one, that would be first criteria. And then secondly, how long is that, uh, organization that's, you know, hosting the vault been in business and what kind of security do they have? But there's tons of really good options out there. I know some people, and that's, I get asked this from time to time too, Dunnigan, should I be housing it overseas? And I personally say no. I, I say, but I always say it's me personally. I would not do that. I want to be able to get access to my gold and silver easily because we saw what happened with COVID. You know, everything was shut down. You couldn't go anywhere. Well, it was harder to go anywhere. Uh, there were rules, restrictions, travel restrictions, uh, you know, uh, in, in flight restrictions, all kinds of crazy stuff going on. You talked about, you know, basically never let a good crisis go to waste. So restriction of travel is very critical to the plan of the WEF and the powers that be, the New World Order. And that's in, you can find that in Agenda 21. You can look at Agenda 2030 and 2050, you know, 15-minute cities. They don't want you to travel. 
So that's a, an important uh, thing to take into account. And the WEF is taking over. If we don't get a handle of WEF infiltration in our states, I mean, we're in really, really big trouble. So close to your house, as close as you can get, I mean, within reasonable driving distance. And uh, and as far as companies go, I hate to name companies because I've, I personally don't do this. So I haven't really looked into it. But I did look into, and once again, this was because of someone mentioned this to me, uh, UPMA Bank in Utah. And so, and this was actually, I'm going to say this was like three years ago, something like that. But I found they had an astoundingly wonderful record of housing people's gold and silver. Of course, there's a small charge for that, but they do a good job. And I suspect that all these other companies do. I have heard people storing in Texas, in the depository in Texas, but I've also heard that they're worried about jurisdictional problems in the end there. And also the fact that they're talking about making a, a bank out of their depository. I mean, for, for them to even be considering that means that they're acquiring quite a few metals in there. And good for you, Texas. I'm certainly not discouraging that. That's a good thing. But people will worry, well, gosh, are they going to fractionally reserve? Are they going to take my money and loan it out to someone else and not even tell me? I mean, this is the, the third party risk we talked about earlier, the moral hazard in banking. So, but at any rate, when you store, uh, and, and I looked into UPMA in Utah, so that's all I can really speak to gang. And this isn't like I'm selling them or anything else like that, but they don't do that. You're, you, you could literally uh, go in and, and see your gold and your silver in that bank at any time you want to. That was one of the th criteria that I looked at. And once again, I was helping someone else out where Utah was very close to them. And so I did ultimately tell them that looks like a good proposition to store your, your wealth, you know, basically with UPMA in the Utah depository. That last principle that you mentioned is one that we uh, insist on, on encouraging our uh, clients who are looking for storage options say, yeah, go ahead look for storage options, but only consider where it's segregated so that your stuff is your stuff. It's your private property. You have legal title to that specific property. It's held for you. You're paying them to guard it for you. You're not paying them to lend it out to, or mix it or commingle it or put it in a pool to count or anything like that. It's your stuff. And you want to get back exactly the same items that belong to you that you put in on, on storage originally. Uh, excellent. So again, the name of the website people should go to if they want to get more information. You bet. Mofree.org. And uh, we're going to open up our forums here real quick nationwide for gold and silver legislation very, very soon. So definitely keep tabs on us at mofree.org. If you're in Missouri, um, I mean, you should be going to this website anyway, get on our email list. If you want to literally get involved in taking back our state from the squishy Republicans, uh, getting good legislation passed. And, and if you're in another state, we still recommend that you follow our work here and try and emulate it somehow. But there's no copyright on anything we do. We're, we're happy to share anything we do with any other state to start a grassroots movement, you know, basically for your liberty. Because believe it or not, the politicians don't have your natural rights and your liberty on their mind. What a shock. Yeah. And and you are blazing the trail there uh, in Missouri among some of the several. There's a very small group of states that are really leading the way. And it's it's for the benefit of all the other states that pay attention and people in those states to educate their own legislatures on why this is important for the people of their state. Uh, so thanks to you for doing that. Thanks for being here and explaining it to our, our viewers. And folks, if you don't want to miss a single interview with Patrick or any of our guests, make sure you get on our free mailing list at libertyandfinance.com. Put your name, your email address, click submit. Make sure you confirm on the confirming email. You'll get one email in your inbox per day with our latest interviews and you won't miss any single thing. So Patrick Holland, founder of the Missouri Freedom Initiative. Thank you for joining us again on Liberty and Finance. God bless you, Dunnigan. Thank you for having us back, mofree.org. God bless you too. Take care. Miles Franklin Precious Metals is one of America's oldest and most trusted bullion dealers. Miles Franklin is A-plus rated and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, licensed and bonded, and has zero complaints ever registered. Here at Liberty and Finance, we are licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. To order, simply call us, discuss your needs, and we can let you know our live inventory, prices, and availability and lock in your order over the phone. Once your order is locked, the price is held for you regardless of market fluctuations, and the metals are reserved for you awaiting your settled payment.
Within one business day of ordering, you will receive an email invoice detailing the order and payment instructions. Miles Franklin accepts payments by bank wire, ACH or electronic check, money order, check mailed priority mail, and cryptocurrency. The fastest forms of payment are bank wire and cryptocurrency. Upon settled payment, metals will ship out within three to five business days. You will receive tracking information via email. Domestic shipping charges are $15 for any order under 500 ounces of silver or 10 ounces of gold. For orders larger than that, domestic shipping is free. The package will be boxed, fully insured, and labeled discreetly, with no indication of the contents inside. For your privacy, the name Miles Franklin will not even be on the package. To talk to myself, Kaiser, my brother Elijah, or my father Dunnigan, call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237.